Are town attraction and retention or improving employee engagement on your radar? If so, building a healthy culture is a critical first step for unlocking potential and driving long-term success. Tier 1 Performance offers several free resources to prime your thinking, assess your culture, and help you get started. If you want to maximize culture to support high-performing teams and thriving organizations, connect with Tier 1 at tier1performance.com forward slash culture. Welcome to The Accidental Trainer, a podcast where you'll hear firsthand stories and tips on how to start and grow your training career. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of ATD Accidental Trainer. I'm your host, Alexandria Clapp, and today we have with us James Robolata. James is a professional speaker and the author of Leading Imperfectly. Hi, James. What is up, friend? Excited to hang out with you today. I'm so excited to chat with you. I reached out to you because I have heard rave reviews about a session that you delivered at ATD 23 last year. And it's a little bit about curiosity. So we're going to dive into that topic. But first, can you tell us a little bit about your background? I'm curious, how did you land in your current role? Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> so I born and raised in Long Island, New York. Let's take it all the way back, right, Alexandria? Let's just start at the start. Um, no, <laughs> yeah, origin story. I was, yeah, I was conceived in anyway. No, um, no. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, born and raised in Long Island, New York. And uh, when I was young, I, I, I realized I wanted to be the next Jacques Cousteau. Um, and uh, I was fascinated by the sea and uh, just loved being on the water. And uh, so I went and got a Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Wow. Uh, I, made it, I made it a little further than most that wanted to hang out with Flipper. Um, and uh, But around my junior year, I realized I was putting too many jokes in my scientific papers. My teacher's were like, this may not be for you. And I was like, you know what? I think you're right. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I was an over-involved student leader on campus. I was an RA. Shout out to my RAs listening. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and so I went and got a master's in counseling from Clemson University. And I worked in higher education uh, developing teams, developing student leaders, running residence halls, campus activities, all that kind of stuff. Did that for a number of years. Absolutely loved it. Um, started taking students that I led to conferences that I went to, that I went to as an undergrad. And those conferences had opportunities to present programs. Then I said, well, shoot, I like attention. And, uh, and so I uh, submitted a, uh, submitted an application to the call for programs uh, and uh, got in um, and wound up just presenting some workshops at these at these small regional conferences. And somebody came up to me after one of my sessions and asked me how much I charged. And that's about when I realized uh, I don't know what my value is, but I'll do anything for uh, a sandwich and tell me I'm pretty. So whatever you want to pay me is fine. But then I also realized maybe I maybe I got something here. Um, and so that's when I started kind of looking into what it meant to be a speaker and what it, what, what that world looked like. So I did it for a few more years where I overlapped the two careers and then went out on my own. And I've been a professional speaker now for about 13 years. I do 70 to 80 engagements a year all around the country and internationally. And, uh, it's been a really, uh, a really special ride. I feel very fortunate. That is really cool. And also, I want to make a note about your jokes and scientific papers. I just think it would have been really interesting if you had continued that career path and mm. maybe even been known for that. I, it just seems like there should be more jokes in scientific papers. You could have yeah. maybe caused some type of revolution over there, but oh, I'm glad that you out. went the route you did take and that we're here now getting to <laughs> chat with each other. <laughs> yeah, right. I think those papers could use a little zhuzh, a little life, right? I mean, I was crushing some puns in there. I just, I, I don't know, just apparently it wasn't appreciated by the educational community. So... <laughs> you know, their, their loss, our gain. Okay, so it's led you to this path of talking about curiosity. 
And I was really intrigued when I saw that session description because I hear people talk about curiosity all the time for innovation or problem solving. And I was even thinking, I mentioned to you successful aging. There's this book I read and it talks about the different personality types and openness um, along with like agreeableness and extroversion. Basically everything but but neuroticism is good for successful aging. Um, but you're 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 talking about something else curiosity for like community building so that has seemed really fascinating to me and i would love to learn more about this and what this might mean for organizational cultures you even had loyalty in your session title so i am so excited to bring this topic to the atd community and with that tell us about the power of curiosity what's up here yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, I agree with you. You hear a lot about it in terms of innovation and and and, and those kind of spaces, and it is obviously exceptional uh, for, for and, and necessary in order to innovate. We have to be curious. <clears throat> so let us keep doing that as well. Um, but uh, in thinking about curiosity, uh, what it comes down to for me is I believe curiosity creates community, and you know. I love asking people little silly questions. Uh, you know, I start all my speeches off with food quirks that I have and the way that I eat pancakes and, um, and just like these unique things. And, uh, it, you know, it brings in the power of relatability, um, into uh, a lot of, a lot of those moments where we kind of just all show up as human beings. And if we're all human beings and then, then that's the plane that we're starting from, then let's learn, let's learn about each other and let's connect. I love ask these questions because questions lead to story story leads to connection connection leads to trust and trust leads to loyalty um Wait, and so can you repeat that again because that seemed like a framework that people need to know <laughs> <laughs> yeah questions uh questions lead to story story leads to connection connection leads to trust trust leads to loyalty which means the foundation of building a loyal team a team that continues to show up for itself um, and continues to buy, rebuy in. Um, <clears throat> uh, the foundation of that loyalty is curiosity. Um, in, in order to get started on that path, um, because once we start to care about each other's stories, um, we start to become more empathetic. We start to become more patient. We start to give each other the benefit of the doubt. We start to recognize that your lived experience is different than my lived experience, but. What if they're both true? Then what? Mm. Um, and I think that's a place where we often miss each other, right? We just we live in our own lived experience, and that's just kind of the way it's always been. Um, and uh, and when we hear that somebody else's lived experience is different than ours, it's it's challenging uh, often to what we just kind of thought we knew, and oftentimes we shut people out in those moments as opposed to getting curious. So what if we asked one more question? Uh, how would our connection level change? And that's, that's really kind of what the foundation of this is for me. I love it. I, my brain's already going in all sorts of different directions. <laughs> one thing I was thinking about was the, the pandemic and how it created this, this unique situation where the entire world was experiencing the pandemic. And I kept hearing sort of different sides of this story. We're all in this experience together. And then someone else saying, well, actually, I'm having a very different experience than you are during this pandemic. But it, it, it just made me think, start to be curious about um, in your work, did you see like a difference where there was sort of a shift where folks were getting a little bit more curious and empathetic together during the pandemic and it sort of changed as we're coming out of it or is that not relevant at all yeah I, I think the pandemic is fascinating for a number of reasons when it comes to curiosity because number one i think that i, I, don't, I don't know about you uh, alexandria but like i feel like i had way uh, richer conversations with folks because we had nowhere else to be Right. So, you know, like all of a sudden I'm in group chats that I wasn't in. I mean, I'm having Zoom dates with uh, friends that I haven't talked to in this way and for so long. But like, where are you going? You're not going anywhere. Um, and uh, and so, you know, so in that way, 
our conversations shifted. We had a little bit more time. There were less things that distracted us. And, and that way it was really beautiful. But in other ways, uh, it also put up these walls and these barriers, whether, you know, not, and I'm not just talking about masks. I'm talking about the distancing. I'm talking about the, we're not finding community, right? Like <clears throat> ATD's conference is canceled and, and, and all that kind of, right? Like all those moments where we start to have these, these events where we used to gather and now we don't. And, uh, and now we're starting to look at each other with a hairy eyeball. <clears throat> and, uh, and so it puts a distance between us and, and that way be, we become more comfortable with our little shell and our own bubble. And maybe we're less curious about others. You know, it, it's fascinating to notice the rhetoric is there was a really good chance that that pandemic could have brought the world closer together. Um, maybe, you know, or at least our, maybe our country. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, but we saw it really deepen a lot of divides um, and was used as a platform to deepen those divides as opposed to bring us together. Um, and that's, that's a whole other conversation that we're probably not going to get into today, but still. So it's interesting to kind of notice those two, those two things where in some ways I feel like a lot of my relationships got deeper because we had more time. We weren't going anywhere. Um, and in other ways, uh, in other ways, it felt like we were more isolated. I love that though, because it makes me think about in an organization, you have an opportunity to bring people together or to deepen divides and mm -hmm. It, that makes me think that there is a mindset, a framework that we can be using to bring people together. So hopefully you can share a little bit more about what does that look like if we're calling it a curiosity mindset or a curious mindset? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, it, it's funny because I, uh, uh, I've noticed that people love to hear a part of your story and then write the rest. Right. Mm -hmm. This is not a novel concept. It's not something that I, I discovered. Right. Um, but like we listen to a little piece of somebody's stories and, and, and we write the rest. We do this because assuming is easier than learning, but just because it's easier doesn't mean it's right. But we do it all the time. And that's because our brains crave efficiency because and the value of time, we all got somewhere to be. We got somewhere to, you know, and we're also told uh, that we got to hurry up. And, and get things done, right? Efficiency is very praised in this country because efficiency often equals dollars. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and we're all trying to make somebody happy, whether it's, uh, whether it's a board or it's, uh, investors or it's a whoever. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, so when it comes to, so when it comes to this idea of, of curiosity, it slows things down and it puts the relationship first. And there's a lot of power in that. When we think about the importance that trust plays in building successful organizational cultures, it's paramount. But the reason why it's paramount is because trust actually breeds efficiency, but it takes time to build. So it feels like it's tedious up top, but that work that you do up top eventually creates the efficiency that many people crave. Because we can have more honest conversations because we believe the other person, because we, we know their intent, we know where their heart is. Um, and if we know where their heart is, then we listen to feedback differently, as opposed to defensively, we listen to it with, oh, you care about me. So when you say this, it actually may be something I should consider and not something I should wall off about. So it just shifts the way that we listen to each other, the way that we respond, and in turn, the way that we connect. Um, and, and that's why I think curiosity is powerful within organizational culture. Okay. I'm right, furiously writing notes down and I'm thinking <laughs> to myself, okay, I want to know about how we listen to each other. I want to know about the questions to ask. I'm going back to this thing that you said in the beginning, which I may be turning into a framework. I don't know if it is, um, where you said questions lead to stories, lead to connection, lead to trust, lead to loyalty. Yeah. And I'm thinking... So do we go in that order or do we go in reverse order and we start with loyalty? Does it matter? What do you think? <laughs> as far as what we do like in life or what we do on this conversation right in here? this conversation, I want to talk oh, about great. all these okay. things, <laughs> but yeah. In both, also, if there's a, if there's a guide for life, well, I'm assuming it's starting. It with is a, it is a, yeah, it is. It is a framework. Um, <clears throat> and, and some that I've been thinking a lot about, um, and you know, I mean, questions are where, Questions are where it all starts. 
Um, because I think we were lied to when we were younger, when we were told that there's no such thing as a bad question. Mm. Uh, right. I think, uh, I would assume you've been asked a bad question in your life, friend. Um, I know, I know I have been, um, and, and great questions drive conversations forward. They drive thought, they inspire, they, they make us pause. Uh, they make us, uh, they connect us. They, uh, they connect that ideas. You know what I'm saying? Like they, they're bigger. <clears throat> um, and, uh, so the power of great questions is awesome. And when it comes to connecting with folks, how, you know, questions lead to story, story leads to connection. When it comes to finding that connection place is that when we ask cool questions of each other, we get to learn each other's stories. And so one of my favorite things is that I don't have some magical question for you right now. Where it's like, next time you're in a conversation, just say this. Um, there isn't like some magical list of five questions that I'm going to give you right That's now. That's exactly what I was going to ask for. <laughs> I know you want them. And people want them, right? People, and I understand why people want them because it's just easy to have things in your back pocket. But if you're if you're holding on to these questions, then are you being present to what the person just said? So instead, it's a there's a phrase that I love. It's just simply tell me more about that. The difference between small talk and a meaningful conversation is one good question. And tell me more about that. Is it necessarily a question, but it's question-esque, right? And so when we think about small talk, it always sounds like, oh my God, this elevator is so slow. Oh, I know, right? I know, right? I know, right? I know, right? It's terrible. Mm -hmm. But within our small talk conversations that we have every single day, if we say, tell me more about that after one of those cliche questions of like, oh, what's, what's your name? What do you do? Where are you from? Where do you, you know, some of those questions. If you say, tell me more about that, all of a sudden we're having a different conversation. More importantly, I think what we're telling the individual that we're talking to is I have time for you. I want to be here. This, this is, this is where I'm excited to be. Small talk conversations feel trite because we're just working our way through the pleasantries so then we can both go our separate ways and feel slightly better about ourselves. But we shift it to a meaningful conversation by giving someone the gift of time, the gift of attention, right? We know, uh, we know what active listening is. Right, we're asking. Uh, we're, we're paraphrasing what they just said. We're squaring our shoulders, good eye contact, and things like that. But we can fake active listen, which is why we need to make the decision to care. And if you make the decision to care, then you're naturally going to ask another question. You're naturally going to do all those steps of active listening, and you're starting. You're going to start to get those stories, and in those stories, we're going to learn about each other. And that's when we start to open our eyes to like, oh, shoot, I didn't, I never knew that about you. Or that's interesting. Or wait, I have a connection with you on that point. I also uh, like to do this. I also play that game. I also have a this. I also, whatever it is. And in those moments of connection, we start to see each other in a really beautiful way. I like this example. Tell me more about that because. That doesn't even feel like a question to me. And then I'm trying to analyze it in my head. And in, I'm going back to something you said about we often do this where we take a piece of someone's story and then we fill in the rest for efficiency, for assumptions. Maybe it's even a cognitive like thing that we do that is yeah. smart for our brains to fill in the gaps. And this type of question, tell me more about that. It's not even like creating a question where maybe I'm actually trying to fill in the rest of a story or assumption that I'm making. It's like, you keep telling me more that there's no, you know what I mean? I'm trying to build yeah. off of this, this the realization that you're creating for me. I love that. Yeah. Oh, Alexander, I don't know about you, but like I have, I have all the time in the world to listen to someone talk to me about something they care about. Right. Like, like it's just I like, I like watching those, the, the sparkle come into people's eyes and like they get really excited. And even if I don't know a lot about it, like let's, let's freaking, if this makes you hype, then let's, let's make each other's days. Right. <clears throat> and let's, and let's have these little moments and these little nuggets where, uh, where someone made us feel a little less crazy um, or a little less alone. And so I love, I love creating those moments. And I think you're right. There is something cognitive in it. It's our brains love patterns. 
patterns make us more efficient, right? And and <clears throat> and so if I told you tomorrow I want you to eat your cereal with your non-dominant hand, you'd be like spilling milk everywhere, right? <laughs> but it would be a disruption where all of a sudden you had to think. Whereas before you can eat your cereal and scroll through your phone or read the paper or whatever you want. Like you can do it all and not have to think about this motion of feeding your face. But as soon as I tell you to switch hands, it disrupts it. So tell me more about that as a disruption from a normal conversation that we're used to having. And those little disruptions cause us to lock in just a little bit there. There's like, oh, wait, something just changed. What was that? Hmm. So I had written down a question for myself that I wanted to remember to ask you, but now I'm wondering if I should re reframe it because I was thinking, okay, you're going to give us examples of better types of questions to ask. And then I'm going to ask, oh, is there a common one that we use all the time and we can reframe that? But now I'm thinking there's probably, you're talking about patterns, there's patterns, there's instances that we have all the time in our workplace setting and can we disrupt that moment with what you're recommending? Does that make sense? <laughs> I, I yes. Think so. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? I think Tell me, am I, am I on the right path? <laughs> Validate me. No. Yeah. <laughs> or no. Or no. Yes. Tell me. No. No. You're great. You're great. Um, it, first off, yeah. Uh, Yes, um, you you are correct. <clears throat> and uh, it, when it comes to when it comes to some of those patterns, you know, there's, uh, for example, let's let's talk about the people in the office as we're talking about building organizational culture or, or organizational community. Because if we focus on thinking about as community and not culture, community is a place where we feel safe, where we feel seen, where we feel heard, where we feel respected. Right. So cultures, culture's great. And I'm not trying to, and this is, you know, we can get into the wordplay of it all. Like, are they really that far apart? But it is a mindset shift to workplace community. Um, <clears throat> and if we want people to feel like they're a part of the community, then what do we have to do? What, what happens next? And ultimately, what happens is that we have to stop assuming that so and so needs this. Right. Or, oh, they're this kind of person. So they probably want this or they're they're from here. So they need this. They want that. Like, we're not asking what they need. We're assuming what they need. Mm. Um, and though we are doing it out of kindness. And forethought, which is also kind, it unfortunately comes back to that concept and diversity, equity, and inclusion work of intent versus impact. Where it's like, yes, your intent was kind, but what's the impact going to be? You don't know. So instead, ask a question. What is that? But ask the question about what does that person need? What would make them X, Y, or Z? What would, how are they feeling? You know what I'm saying? And, and creating a genuine uh, container and safe container to have that conversation, patient container to have that conversation is important. Um, and so those are the kind of moments that I think we're talking about here because I'm sure in your workplace, Alexandria, you have folks that you are pumped uh, that when, you know, when they pop up on a Zoom call or when you see them in an office that you haven't seen them in a while, you didn't realize you were going to bump into them together today. Uh, you didn't realize you were going to bump into them. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, my gosh, hi. And they make you really happy, right? And you're super excited because that person just, I don't know, they just make you feel good. But then you also have somebody else in the office that's like, oh, God, here we go. Right, because some people we work with are annoying, <laughs> but you're in patterns with both of those folks. Mm, I like that you're in patterns with both of them. Because when you see the person that you love, you put a filter up. That's like, oh, this person's great. This is amazing, and I can talk to them about whatever, and I can share what I, I can share more of me. I can whatever. I, my shoulders drop. But you also put a filter up when that other person comes up to you. And your filter is like, here we go again. What are they going to complain about next? What did I do wrong now? What are they going to teach me about myself? What are they going to mansplain to me? What are they, whatever it is, right? Um, and so uh, both of those patterns deserve to be disrupted. And I think they're disrupted with curiosity. Mm. Okay. So I'm taking that in. And I want to try to disrupt this pattern that I have with this person that I'm creating this negative filter. I'm telling myself they're annoying. I'm making this story. How do I, how do, I do that? What do I yeah. do? First off, let's be honest, Alexandria. They probably are annoying. 
Right? Some people are some people are just annoying to us, right? Let us be human beings. I would love to be like, oh, we're going to go around and just love everybody. No, that's garbage, right? Some people are annoying, and the goal is not to go from this person is annoying to oh my god, we're best friends, then we hang out all the time. The goal is to go from annoying to understanding, mm-hmm. annoying to benefit of the doubt, and so so if we set that more achievable goal. A attainable goal, since we're setting smart goals. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, since you know, if, the, if that's the goal, then uh, I think the pattern disruption looks like a couple. It can look like a couple of things because we all are in different workplace settings. Some people are hybrid. Some people are not. Whatever it is. So one way to disrupt the pattern is that you probably frequently see this individual in the same one or two or three places. So what if you? met with them somewhere else. If you disrupted where you met them, would you also disrupt the kind of conversation that you have just to change the environment? And it doesn't necessarily have to be something like we're going out to lunch, but it could be like, let's go down and grab a cup of coffee. Let's, you know, let's go to the Starbucks that's outside of the building or uh, this program, this podcast is brought to you by Starbucks, right? Just want to make sure I nailed the sponsor. Did I get it? Okay, great. Uh, we're working on an AT thing, but <laughs> <laughs> but still, right? Like, what if you disrupt? Because you probably only see them in that meeting or in that cubicle or in that whatever. So if you disrupted where you met them, if you, even if you sat on a different bench in the office, are you having a different conversation with them? Do you meet them on a different floor? Um, <clears throat> or if you normally are in a hybrid workplace and you're connecting with them on Zoom, do you go for a walk? Right? Do you tell that person, hey, let's let's both go for a walk and, or, or do something. Um, try to disrupt some of those kinds of things and just see if the conversation shifts a little bit. That's a simple thing that we can do. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, yeah, I, I think that I think that's where we start. I love that you went for the example because that's uh, I was going to ask you. What if you're always just seeing them in the same Zoom room or in the same Teams chat, and you yeah. answer my question? You, Mm-hmm. You can still create a new environment by putting yourself in a new environment. I like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's also vulnerable, right? Because at some point in time, like you can suggest those things. And ideally, you can suggest them without having to get into like, I feel like we have a strange relationship. Yeah. Let's, you know, let's, you know, like, because um, first off, it's always, uh, I hate that moment that I know, I'm, I'm sure you've had before where you're vulnerable about something to somebody and like, oh, I've never noticed that. Well, I've never even seen that before. It's like there's, there's no freaking way you've never you've never felt an awkward thing between or whatever, right? Like, and then you all of a sudden you feel stupid. And you're like, is it just me? Am I creating everything in my head, right? And so, so if there's a way to bring it up where you don't have to name, like, hey, this is this is feeling a little strange. This is feeling a little awkward. It's feeling a little whatever. Like, you know, or I feel like we got off on the wrong foot. That's always awesome. But if you do have to say something like that, then that's, that's, you know, that's fair too. Uh, you know, maybe we can spin it to like, I, I want to get to know you a little bit more. I feel like, I feel like in some of these meetings, we're not, we're not always connecting the way I wish we would. Right. And try to try to spin it to the positive side of things. Um, and so in doing so and doing so, like, I, w- I want to try to shift the way that we've been connecting. Let's, let's try to meet in a different location or meet in a different whatever. I love this as you're, I keep, you keep answering questions as they're coming up for me. And when you just continue talking, because I <laughs> started to think, well, what if your strength or personality is you're very direct and you call things as you see them and you don't want to kind of paint it with this other brush, calling it something else. But I like that you sort of communicating, communicated it as been to the positive. And you, there's still a way that you can be direct and say, you know, the ultimate goal, I want to shift our connection with each other yes. without maybe creating your story or their story, what you think is the perceived story of this dynamic yeah. that you have with this person. So there's yeah. still a way to do it without kind of jumping into the that negative piece that's maybe happening. Yeah. Yeah, I think there is, but ultimately confrontations are going to happen, right? And we can't, we also can't be afraid of those kinds of things. And that's where things like I statements or, uh, you know, I was on, I, I, I have a, 
a strained friendship where I live right now that I'm, I'm trying to kind of figure out what, what role this person is going to play, play in my life moving forward. And, uh, and, and, but I'd like to have them as a friend, but I just, I've, I've been hurt by them. And so, so I was talking to my counselor about this, shout out to Kelly, my counselor and, uh, and, and Kelly, you know, encouraged me to have a conversation with them of like, Hey, this is, this is the story that I've been writing. And I recognize that this is a story that I have been writing. And so I wanted to have a conversation with you about like, hey, is, is the story accurate? Um, or, or what's, what's, you know, how are you perceiving the way some of these events went down? Um, and and, and let, let's connect on it because I'm feeling hurt and it's causing me to be a little more distant from you. But I see you reaching out and I, I want to talk about uh, some of the confusion that I'm having. And so that's kind of the way that Kelly encouraged me to have that conversation is kind of to own like, this is how, this is the story that I have been writing instead of being like, this is the way it is. Right. And so coming at it from that angle um, is, is a way to kind of, I don't know, use I statements in a way that, I don't know, sometimes when we use I statements, it feels really forced. Like I feel that when I, and <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I love that. It made me think of, I think I was listening, maybe listening to an Adam Grant podcast and he talked about how he feels like he gets the feedback to be more vulnerable. And he thinks that means that he has to disclose personal information about himself, like what's happening in his personal life. Mm -hmm. But as you were going through that example, it could be just being vulnerable about what's on my workload right now, what's on my plate, and what other projects am I doing that means that I dropped the ball on this, or I'm not aligned because I'm still waiting to hear from this other person. And it's all just giving more exposure information, maybe helping fill in those gaps. And I'm not saying I got a new pillow and I didn't like sleeping on it last night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's so many different layers of vulnerability, um, right? I mean, vulnerability isn't just like, Oh, why don't you share your darkest insecurities with me? No, you go first. Uh, right? like, <laughs> <Yeah. which laughs> a lot of people don't want to have to do that. Like All I, right. can I still be vulnerable and get along with my coworkers and not tell them about what's happening in my personal life. Like, I don't want to go into all those details. Yeah. Yeah. And I think so. I mean, there's, there's layers to vulnerability, right? Vulnerability is, you know, I have, I have people in some of my programs share embarrassing stories with each other, right? That's vulnerable, even though they're just a silly little story, right? I have people share food quirks. That's vulnerable. Just p little pieces of you that probably aren't normally seen. And uh, yeah, I mean, obviously some of the stuff that's going on in your life, uh, that, that's a lot of what we're talking about here is because as you start to build trust, then you can start to lower your walls and name things if you believe the people around you genuinely care about you. But oftentimes, we don't believe the people around us genuinely care about us, that everybody's got an ulterior motive or everybody's just kind of going through the motions. Um, and so that's why curiosity is such a cool disruption in that in that space, too. I want to go to one of the words that you said in your framework, your phrase. The last piece was loyalty. And I think that that word can mean different things for different people. Uh, and it can sometimes, I don't know, maybe have a negative connotation where you feel like you're you're being asked to be loyal as an employee to your organization, but they're not necessarily loyal to you. So I'm just curious about sort of unpacking that and how it plays a role in this curiosity community thing. And I'll stop talking so that you can fill us in. <laughs> I like when you talk. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, loyalty is, is definitely there. There's a, there's a place where loyalty gets awkward. Right. And kind of gets like, it gets almost dark. Uh, that's not what we're talking about here. <clears throat> okay. when, and, and when I think about loyalty, I think about the concept of somebody who is re buying in to the mission, oh, like re buying that. into the team, re buying in to uh, the work, re buying into whatever. Because our relationship with our work, with our teams, with our people ebbs and flows. And if, if when we're in a valley, you choose to not rebuy in, then you check out and you dismiss or you write people off or you stop giving them the benefit of the doubt. But if you rebuy in, then you recommit to like, nah, this, it doesn't have to be like this. So let me recommit to it. 
Let me re let me try to rebuy in. You know, loyalty is often confused with longevity. Hmm. Um, and I longevity isn't always a sign of loyalty because we all know people who have been in their job for 35 years and have been complaining for 35 years. Right. <clears throat> um, you know, I know a number of folks that are in their role because they're like, well, I just should be grateful that I have a job. Um, and it's like, do you like the job? Do you care about the work? Do you right? like those kinds of things? And so, uh, loyalty and longevity, um, uh, shouldn't be confused. They can be one and the same for sure. If that person has continued to rebuy in and believes in the mission and can point to the mission statement and say, you know, in this one or two sentence phrase, I know I bring these two or three words to life. My work goes to this, and therefore, I feel attached to it and the bigger picture. Um, <clears throat> I think those are the kind of things that breed the kind of loyalty that companies want and organizations want, that teams want. So many good insights. I love the differentiation between loyalty and longevity. I'm looking at the time, and I had one more question I wanted to ask you before we switch gears and talk a little bit about you again. Um, do you have any recommendations for managing comfortable versus uncomfortable moments? I think I saw that language in your session description, and I loved it because I think that you need to be uncomfortable to learn. And so I was curious what what that meant in the context of your this curiosity and community opportunity. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, I. I they always, we always talk about how when you're uncomfortable, that's when you're, you're pushing, you're pushing out of your comfort zone. And that's important. That's where we grow when we're uncomfortable, but no one wants to stay uncomfortable, right? Like, <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and no one wants to work in a place where they're continuously uncomfortable. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, in having these, in having these really important conversations, I think this is where relatability comes in. Related because when we are relatable to somebody, or, or let me try this again. When we see ourselves in someone else, we believe that we can, hmm. and that's what I think relatability breeds. And so, when we do things like difficult conversations, feedback, and and whatnot, I always encourage people to start with a story. You know, start with a time where you slipped, where you stepped in something, and and or or, or didn't do something, or did do something that caused a ripple effect that you didn't realize it was going to cause. That's related to what this person is that you're trying to inspire a growth moment in. And if we're by creating that story, we're also being like, hey, let's not forget we're all humans here, right? This is a place where we slip, we fall, we get back up, we figure it out, and we win. Um, and uh, and so so I think that's. A place where we start to lead with love and not fear. And and leading with love, leading with love takes curiosity. If we don't practice curiosity, then we're not actually getting to know somebody. And this is where, you know, I've 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 done the, I could tell you my top five strengths. I could tell you my Enneagram, my MBTI. We can talk about the Kinsey. We could talk about like, like Colby, whatever. We can go as, as deep as you want into all those kinds of things. But oftentimes when we do those assessments, we focus on our own results and not how we now need to communicate with so and so because they're like this. Um, and, and that's, that's the leap that we sometimes forget to take in some of those moments. Um, and the other leap that we sometimes forget to take is, is asking folks on the front end about how they are, uh, how are they are feeling in this moment? How are they feeling like they're being treated? How are they, all those kinds of stuff. And we often don't like to ask those questions because what if we find out that someone's not as happy? What if we find out that something's wrong or that someone's been offended or someone's been hurt? A lot of times when I hear managers or supervisors tell me like, oh, everybody loves each other around here. We're all doing great. Uh, every, everybody's doing great. I think everybody's fine. We all feel respected. No one's ever come up to me and complained about feeling unheard or feeling unsupported or feeling uh, <clears throat> um, uh, whatever it against. Um, and, uh, and I often tell those individuals is it that you're really running a perfect organization or have you just not created or, or have you just not created a container where people feel safe and talking to you? 
And <clears throat> so I think when we start with story, it creates more relatable moments. I think when we also approach conversations metaphorically with our palms up of just, you know, like I, I, I truly want to be here and I want to help. We've all had conversations with people before. We're like, I have an open door policy. But if you ever actually use their open door policy, they're pretty pissed off that you're in there because I got stuff to do. Right. <clears throat> um, and so, uh, so yeah, where, where are some of that? I'm kind of, I'm kind of talking in a bunch of circles right now because you got me thinking about a whole bunch of stuff. And so I'm going to try to bring it back together. But <clears throat> ultimately, the role that curiosity plays in these conversations is critical. But we have to be willing to hear something that doesn't make us feel good. I am taking notes and the the response that you gave made me think about how this is relevant. These recommendations are, are relevant if you're having one-on-one -on -one meetings with your manager um, or maybe whether you're the manager, whether you're the employee, whether you're leading trainings or you're creating learning environments. Cre that's creating a container. There's always going to be a place where it's an environment and are you making that... Uh, environment where you're fostering curiosity, um, whether it's even just with your peers, like it's some of the examples. So I just think it's it's versatile and applies in all sorts of different situations where yeah. there's going to be moments of uncomfortableness and how you navigate that. Yeah. That's why I don't, you know, I don't, and I know I'm not alone in this. Um, <clears throat> so let me, let me not be on a high horse about it, but uh, that's why I don't always love the phrase safe space. Because you can't guarantee mm. safety. Yeah. So the way I try to spin it is let's make it a patient space. And if we make it a patient space, then are we creating an environment where uh, folks try to give each other a little bit more benefit of the doubt or folks want to respond with a question as opposed to an assumption? Um, and, you know, are we when we slow it down just a little bit? Are we getting to a more accurate description of a problem and therefore closer to its solution? I love it. I know we could keep talking about this, but I want to put a pin in it for now so that we can get back to talking about you a little bit before we wrap up for today. So what are your learning goals or how are you getting out of your comfort zone this year? Yeah, for sure. So I have uh, two kids under three. Um, and, uh, I'm sure by the time this comes out, actually, my son will probably be three. Um, but, uh, so a lot of the learning and work that I am doing is internal. Um, like I mentioned my shout out to my counselor, Kelly. Um, and, uh, and so a lot of the work that I'm doing right now is working on being more patient and finding more grace in my life. Mm -hmm. So if I could take it, uh, maybe maybe not professionally, if you don't mind if I take it personally, cause that's, that's really the journey that I'm on right now. You know, I'm doing something, it's called internal family systems is the type of, of therapy that I've, I've chosen to kind of invest in because it's, it's called parts work. Um, and we all have these parts inside of us that were created um, during moments of, of trauma or during experiences. And my counselor likes to talk about trauma with big T and little T because um, sometimes we have little small moments of trauma. They're not, you know, these big, huge uh powerful things that sometimes happen to folks, um, devastatingly so. Um, but sometimes it's just little things of like, you know, someone said this to you and you never forgot it, right? Those little, those small T trauma moments. And, uh, and in those moments, a part of us is created to protect us. And now here we are, here I am, you know, 20, 30, uh, some odd years later, and those parts are still trying to protect me, but I've evolved and I've mm -hmm. grown and I no longer need some of them. Um, and so how can I say, hey, thank you, part, uh, for coming up and, and, and trying to protect me right now in this moment, but I don't think I need you, right? Ang anxiety part, uh, judgmental part, whatever, whatever it is, right? <clears throat> and uh, so I'm trying to do that because I want to be more present. In this moment with my with my children, and I frequently juggle between uh, uh, struggle between ambition and presence, um, and uh, and so that's the work that I'm currently really working on. Um, is uh, it's funny? It's 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 what I teach, right? Like I'm, uh, what if I'm, you know, 
I, I ask people in a lot of my talks, you know, what if you're, uh, what if you're good enough to lead right now as you are, right? Like what, you know, <clears throat> how, how would you lead if you knew that you were enough? How would you love if you knew that you were enough? You know, for me, you know, how would I parent if I knew that I was enough? Um, and, uh, and how, you know, how would I be a, a better partner if I knew that I was enough? And so, you know, those are the kind of things that, that I'm currently working on and working through. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I love that. That yep. sounds like it's probably benefits you in so many ways in your work um, and in your life with your family and your kiddos. Yay. Uh, Yay. Can, you, <laughs> can you tell us where can folks keep up with your activity and find you if they want to keep learning from you? Mm -hmm. Heck yeah. Uh, I am James T. Robo, R-O-B-O, -O, James T. Robo all over the internet, James T. Robo.com, James T. Robo, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, whatever you want. We out there. Um, and I've been posting a lot of meaningful content on, on some of those platforms. And uh, I'll also be back at, at ATD. I'm really excited. I'll be there this uh, this year again. I don't know when this this podcast comes out, but hopefully it's before the national conference. But uh, if it is, um, then uh, yeah, I'll I'll be there uh, delivering uh, my curiosity stuff as well. So I, I hope we get to hang out. And if you listen to this, please come up and say hi to me um, or connect with me. Right? I'm obviously James Robolot on LinkedIn. Uh, if we want to keep it professional, that's fine. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, this has been really special. Thank you, Alexandria. You're a, a wonderful question asker. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure that you say that to everyone, though, because you're not making stories, but I will, I will take the compliment. I appreciate it. It's been such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much, James. Absolutely. And I don't say it to everybody because some people are trash at asking questions. So <laughs> <laughs> great. I'm no a New Yorker, that. Alexandria. Okay. You're going to get it straight. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye, friend. Thank you to our sponsor, Tier 1 Performance.